All right, good evening, everyone. I am Elder Harris. Again, we are going back to the Gospel of John to continue our quick, powerful study of the Gospel of John. We'll be in John chapter 11 again today for the final installment of this particular chapter, and we'll cover uh, the last verses. John chapter 11, verses 47 through 57. So in review, the beginning of John chapter 11 had Jesus leave the Jerusalem area because he was almost stoned for saying that he was one with God and saying that he was in the Father and the Father was, was within him. So Jesus had to leave because they tried to stone him because they thought it was blasphemous. Jesus heads east across the Jordan, and he's in the place where John the Baptist used to preach. And it was at that point or that place where Jesus found uh, or got word that Lazarus, his close family friend, was sick. And so what we covered last week was Jesus travels to Lazarus, that is to say, heading west back across the Jordan River into that contested territory where people had days earlier tried to stone him. And in that place, Jesus makes contact with Mary and Margaret, the sisters of Lazarus, and Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So here we find that Jesus has proven himself to be both the resurrection and the life. He's granted his disciples the opportunity to increase their faith embracing Jesus as more than just a healer, but as a restorer of life. And he's also made believers out of the witnesses that thought they were coming to mourn Lazarus's death, but they found out that Jesus is a resurrector of dead things. And so now they're fellowshipping with the risen Lazarus. While many folks saw this miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, and they believed on Jesus because of it, naturally, a few of the people that were witnesses to this miracle of Lazarus being resurrected, they went back and they told Jesus' detractors, the Pharisees. So that's where we pick up in verse 47, because after these particular, these detractors go back, or after these witnesses go back to let the Pharisees know what Jesus has done in raising a man from the dead, what we have is verse 47 documents that they are, that is to say the Pharisees, they bring some people together. And here we have the beginning of a behind the scenes conspiracy. So to be clear on some of the words and titles we'll be using, I do wanna take a few moments to discuss some of the key players in this narrative so that we're all clear we're on the same page. You're gonna hear a group called the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a religious party. Um, Pharisee meant separated or uh, separated ones. And this was a religious party that believed staunchly in certain parts of the Old Testament, in addition to many teachings and traditions of whom they call the elders, that is to say, uh, older rabbis that had gone on before them. And it is crucial that you remember that Pharisees believed in the Old Testament's uh, and the traditions of the elders. It's crucial that you remember that because Jesus challenges this group called the Pharisees because they sometimes put more emphasis on the elders' or man's word than they have God's word. In either case, the Pharisees were more numerous and had more sway with the, the numerous common folk of the community. That's to say that within the Jewish community, all of whom were those that subscribed to the Jewish faith, the Pharisees were the religious party that was most numerous of the religious parties. And so they had more sway with the common folks. More sway when compared to that of the Sadducees. The Sadducees were a group whose name, Sadducees, is rumored to have come from the word righteousness, Sadek, uh, righteousness. And the Sadducees were a religious party as well, but they were different from the Pharisees in that the Sadducees were an aristocratic uh, type religious party. Now they believed more strict parts or more strict um, sets of tenets. Uh, the Sadducees believed in the first five books of the Bible only, like the first five books of the Old Testament, or Testament Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's all they believed. And they excluded from that belief system what was supernatural. So angels, you know, the, the uh, spirit of God, all that supernatural stuff, the Sadducees did not believe that. And the Sadducees, though aristocratic and had uh, money, 
uh, the Sadducees were less numerous than the Pharisees. And because they had more money, the Sadducees may well have had less sway on the common folk of the community because common folks at times are less likely to listen to super rich folks. You know, it's kind of hard to hard for the common folk to connect with rich, rich folks. So we got the Pharisees and the Sadducees, two groups of whom you'll hear uh, plenty about if you're looking through the Jesus narrative. And you're also going to hear about this group called the Council or the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, without going too far into it, is the Supreme Court of the Jewish faith group at this time. Uh, they were the highest ruling council of the community. And so we got the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the council. All of those you're going to hear later in this study. Getting to the text, verse 47 uh, starts us off with the convening of the council. The council was convened to <clears throat> address a threat. And the threat was to the rule of the council, you know, like bringing together a brain trust of super powerful people. That's what this was. It was an emergency planning meeting and they came together to formulate a solid plan on how to address Jesus. Uh, Jesus at this point had faced threats of execution, uh, arrest attempts, uh, and public rebuke, and even defamation of character. None of those things had dissuaded Jesus from, from continuing to minister, and this was problematic to this council uh, made up of uh, priests, for sure, Sadducees and Pharisees and elders. And so the reasons that this council felt that Jesus had to be stopped and we're looking in verses 47 through 48 of John 11. The reason that they felt that Jesus had to be stopped was because he was doing a lot of miracles. And some of these miracles were irrefutable and messianic. Messianic means, when I say messianic, what I'm referring to is that it is an instance that um, leads one to believe that the person making this thing happen is the Messiah. These miracles to the council who wanted people to turn away from Jesus and stop listening to Jesus were problematic because the council had been part of the teaching group that was teaching certain things that if these things occur, the person that makes them occur is the Messiah, okay? And some of these messianic uh, miracles or signs include, well, I'll just walk you through three of them. Um, the messianic signs, that is to say, if someone can do this thing, in this time frame, among these people, it was taught that that person would be the Messiah. Jesus did those things. The first of which is the healing of a leper by actually touching the leper. Uh, in Mark chapter one, verses forty through forty-five, uh, we're looking at an instance where Jesus does exactly that. He touched a leper. Nobody would touch a leper on purpose because if you touch a leper, obviously you're going to get leprosy. Uh, in that time, the the the, the place where their uh, faith and their teaching was that there was a ceremonial uncleanness and defilement associated with leprosy. So you would also risk a spiritual uncleanness by making physical contact with a leper. Well, Jesus not only touched the leper, but healed the leper. And according to Dr. Arnold uh, Fruchtenbaum from Ariel Ministries, no Jew at that point have ever been, had ever been healed of leprosy. And so when Jesus comes into this community and he not only uh, uh, does not ostracize the leper, but makes contact with the leper without contracting leprosy, but heals the leper, Jesus has qualified as one that has performed a messianic sign. The sign that Jesus is the Messiah. That's the first messianic sign. The second messianic sign was uh, that Jesus was able to cast out a demon that causes muteness. In that time frame, the strategy used for exorcists or people that would expel demons was that the people, what they would do, whoever the religious person is, whatever the religious team is, they would contact the person with the demon and they would get the demon to tell the, the minister their name. And so once the demon gives up the name, the person trying to expel the demon can use the demon's name to cast the demon out. Well, that works until you got a demon that won't speak and ties up the tongue of somebody that can't speak because then you can't hear the name 
and then you can't cast out the demon. So it was said that anybody that could cast out a mute demon was the Messiah. And so this was a messianic miracle. Well, Jesus did it. In, in Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 23, we see that Jesus cast out a, a demon that caused muteness. And so Jesus was showing again that he was the Messiah by performing these messianic signs thought to only be possible by way of the Messiah. And, and lastly, you all remember a couple of videos ago, we looked through John chapter nine and another messianic miracle was if a person could heal someone that was born blind, that person must be the Messiah. Because blindness, especially from birth, or particularly from birth, was thought to be a punishment from some sort of sin, be it from the person in the womb or from the parent. And, and no one at that point before Jesus came had ever been healed of blindness from birth. Now, people who had been healed that had become blind after they were able to see for a time, but no one had been healed of blindness from birth except Jesus did it thereby qualifying himself a third time as the Messiah. And so as we're looking at this council, and this council is legitimately worried, and they're saying, this Jesus is doing a lot of miracles. We have to stop him because he keeps qualifying, according to our own teaching and reason, to be the Messiah. And we can't have everybody else going after him. You see, the, the word miracle, as it relates to Jesus doing all these miracles, uh, miracle in the original language means a like a distinguishing mark. So Jesus's miracles, they distinguished him from others. And as signs do, they carried a message and people were starting to get that message. That is to say the religious rulership that at the time was opposing Jesus was losing out because people were looking at Jesus and getting the message that he was not only speaking, but doing. So the believers, in supporters and the supporters of Jesus' ministry, that, that base, that, that, that population was growing. People were coming to Jesus and becoming believers more and more and more as they got more understanding of what Jesus was doing. He was proving himself to be the Messiah, to be the Son of God. And the council, they, they realized that if they don't stop Jesus' ministry, some bad things are going to happen. Now, if you look at verse 48 of John 11, you see what they're saying. Uh, the council had re re resolved that if they let Jesus alone, everybody is going to believe on him, and the Romans will come and take their place and their nation. That's what the King James Version says. When we see the word place here, the council is referring to uh, likely the temple, the temple that is the pride of the Jewish faith, the pride of the Jewish people at the time, the center of their worship for the entire region, the, 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 the gathering place during every major, during these major feasts, uh, the, the place where they expect to hear from God, the place where the high priest uh, goes in to make contact with God. They don't want to lose this place. And so when they say that Jesus could be a threat if everyone believes in him, they're saying they're worried that the Roman government, who was the world power at the time, world power at the time, the Roman government had the, the ability to come in and smash the Jews and take everything and on the docket for everything would be the sacred temple, this second temple, this Herod's temple that was built after Solomon's temple was destroyed. They didn't want to lose that. It was so uh, crucial to them and their identity as a people that they maintained this facility, that they maintained this facility and they didn't want Jesus to be the cause or Jesus' ministry to be the cause of people believing and the Roman government, coming, Roman government coming down as a repercussion of that belief. Now, let's, let's take into account this other thing. The idea of Messiah at the time, and according to the expectation of many of these folks, was that the Messiah would be the one that would come down and be the legitimate king of the Jews. That part we're okay with. Where there is an erroneous conception is that the Messiah at the time would lead an earthly rebellion. And this is where there was a messed up presumption because these religious rulers didn't want to risk 
a rebellion against the Roman government because the Roman government was vicious, vicious and was able to and willing to, had a reputation for obliterating enemies. And so when the council, this religious rulership is considering Jesus, they don't want to lose their place. That is to say, they don't want to lose their temple. All that could be stripped by the Roman government if people come up in rebellion from thinking that Jesus is trying to lead some sort of revolt, which he wasn't. In addition to the place, in addition to the place, um, their other concern was that the Roman government would also come and take their nation. By take their nation, what is meant is that uh, the Roman government could potentially deal cruelly with them or scatter them, that persecute them to where they became uh, the diaspora again. The Jewish diaspora uh, hurt their family integrity by literally killing off thousands of them um, if everyone would come to believe in, on Jesus. This was the perceived result of this council were people to continue to believe on Jesus. They thought it would have a, uh, an effect on the population that would make the population invoke the wrath of the Roman government. And so <laughs> they didn't want Jesus' ministry to push forward. Now, there are some, some interesting notes in that. When we look at the concern of this religious rulership, we found that the religious rulership, they didn't want the government to shut down their church. And so they were willing to shut down Jesus. This is emblematic of their own self-preservation of what they feel like they've inherited, what they feel like was their land, their home, their holy place, their temple and their worship center. They thought that through their own strength, they were to preserve that. And we see how they looked at Jesus, that is to say God in human flesh. And they looked at God as a threat to their inheritance. They thought God would be a threat to their worship. So we see here that something something doesn't match. Something's off. Additionally, in trying to preserve their people, their family integrity by not being scattered and, and obliterated by the Roman government, they attempted to have uh, the, their way of life preserved, uh, the, the, their relative freedom, their, their family groupings and family gatherings, they tried to preserve it. These are things that they wanted to do on their own strength, and they looked at Jesus and his divine message as a threat to that. And it, it, it's, it's, it's really uh, almost ironic because we know that Jesus would bring freedom, would bring a greater degree of family. You know, in trying to preserve their nation, it's, it's like these uh, people didn't want the government, that is to say the Roman government, to be unkind to their congregation. So they were willing to be unwelcoming to Jesus. These are the deliberations in between verses 47 and 48 of uh, John 11. By the time we get to verses 49 through 50, we have a, a solution that comes up, and um, not many of us are going to like it, but it happened. Um, it, it is a politically expedient solution. It's, it's conspiracy. Um, allow me to, to jump off of the narrative just briefly to clarify some terms again for you. We've covered the Pharisees, we've covered the Sadducees, we've covered the council and its function. Um, and in the council, I think I've already expressed to you that the Sanhedrin or this council was a group of top level religious leaders that controlled the Jewish community. Um, it would include chief priests, scribes, elders, all of whom, um, according to Matthew 26 and three, they had gathered at Caiaphas's house. And Caiaphas was the sitting high priest or highest priest at the time. Now, a high priest is the highest ranking and presiding member of the Sanhedrin council. And so he is the singular most powerful religious authority within this body of religious rulers, the Sanhedrin council. And the Jewish high priest under the rule of the Roman government uh, would be appointed by the Romans at this time and fired by the Romans. So just to, to recap what I just said, that's to say the religious, the religious presiding, the, the person that presided over the religious body, the high priest, he was appointed by the civilian. 
carnal government because at that time, the Roman government ran everything because they were the world power. And they were allowing the Jews to have some, some method or some, some measure of self-rule. And the measure of self-rule was the council would rule the Jewish community. And we expected the council to keep things quiet and keep things going well in the Jewish community. And so at the top of the council would be Caiaphas the high priest, but Caiaphas the high priest was appointed by the Roman government, wasn't supposed to be this way. And so you can imagine how one in a religious place of authority, whose boss is actually a civilian government official, how they would act and how their mind would work, potentially not to the greatest benefit of the saints or the children of God, and likely to the whim of civilian government. So the leadership, the religious leadership, was essentially in the pocket of the Roman government. This means that religious leadership uh, of the Jewish faith at that time was heavily involved with and influenced by Roman politics. Now, we know that the Romans for uh, religious practices, a number of them were um, uh, pagan or, or polytheistic at that time. Um, but what we're looking at is the Roman political influence on the religious leadership. And this also means that the religious leadership at this time of, of the Jewish faith in this place and in this time would actively avoid the wrath of the Roman government because um, they, they didn't want to provoke the Roman military to come in. Because you know, when you offend a government or its policy or its political body, you risk the wrath or the backlash of that government's military. And so here we start to pull together the picture that this religious body of rulers whose existence and responsibility and accountability in a lot of cases was to a foreign government, that is to say to the Roman government, they were in the pocket of the Roman government and they were fearful of the Roman government. And so the high priest of this religious body, the council, or of the, uh, the council called the Sanhedrin uh, was Caiaphas. And Caiaphas was also one of those people that was kind of connected. First of all, Caiaphas was a Sadducee, which means he had money, which means that now we can understand why he had a palace in which he could pull together this emergency meeting of all those that were part of the Sanhedrin. Caiaphas's father-in-law was the high priest before him. So he not only had money, not only had, uh, as a Sadducee, not only had super restrictive views of what uh, God's word said, um, but he was also politically connected and uh, uh, po potentially politically owned professionally. Um, but he was also within the family of someone that was high priest before him. And so you're starting to get this picture of uh, where this next idea is about to come from. Caiaphas presented an idea that hadn't yet been discussed by the Sanhedrin Council. The Sanhedrin Council had discussed the problem, which was to them, Jesus, and people believing on Jesus, and the potential that their belief on Jesus would incite a riot, which would provoke Roman government to come and smash the entire Jewish community. Caiaphas offers an idea that the high council knew nothing. Like, y'all don't know anything. Yeah, verse 49 uh, puts Caius as saying, you know nothing at all. Y'all don't know what you're talking about. And uh, it was presented, Caiaphas, I, Caiaphas's idea was presented as if it would benefit the council. He, he said that there was an idea he was going to present that would be what's called expedient. That's in your Bible. You know, we have a term nowadays called politically expedient. And it's a scary term because it means eh, some ugly is about to happen, but we expect to gain a political advantage off of what's about to happen. Here in verse 50 of John 11, we have the word expedient there. And expedient means advantageous, convenient, or profitable. And Caiaphas says that it is expedient for us. So Caiaphas's thinking is one that the council in discussing this Jesus problem, that they don't know anything. He's, Caiaphas says, y'all don't know anything. And then he says, I'm going to tell you what's expedient for us in here. I'm going to tell you what's expedient for 
us potentially as a nation. Caiaphas is about to deliver his bright idea under the uh, umbrella of what appears to be or will be presented as expedient. And the politically expedient idea was that one person should die rather than the entire Jewish community, the entire population. Political expediency here, it, it would knowingly commit to killing one thing to keep another alive. That, that's what Caiaphas has presented to this body of rulers here, of religious leaders and, and rulers. Um, Caiaphas says that we, we, we can kill off one person so that we can save everyone else. And this is something that at the uh, back room of a political discussion, at the back room of uh, leadership, you know, in, in a place that's locked down and no one can really get into and only people with the highest clearance can access, that there's a conversation happening that uh, one person innocently should die so that the way of life in the community and the facility can be saved. It's like killing one thing to keep other things alive. It, it's like when someone would choose to um, kill off their future uh, so that they can live in the moment. It, it's like when uh, someone can choose to abandon their long-term goals to pursue a cheap thrill tonight. Like when one person chooses to kill off their dreams uh, to enjoy a, a, a fantasy or or like burying burying the truth to keep a lie alive that that is part of what is wrapped up in this decision this expedient decision it is an ungodly for sure uh, decision but it is put under the guise of expediency it is how uh, carnal people think in order to preserve things on their own power, they get expedient, that is to say, uh, dangerously pragmatic. This is the decision that is presented by the ruler of a religious body here with regard to uh, political connections and with regard for what they owned, their place, their power, their position. And it was presented by the high person, the presiding uh, person over this religious rulership body, the council. They said it was expedient to kill off Jesus so that they could make their attempt at saving the Jewish community. Uh, these politically expedient men of power, uh, they, they would rather have Jesus killed because they thought killing Jesus would secure their land and their family and their heritage, their culture, their way of life. This is uh, something like what happens to a lot of people today. Folks do that today for sure, absolutely. They just do a little bit different. In their, their minds and their hearts, what they want, they would rather silence God, silence the word of God, silence Jesus' talk, silence Jesus' ministry so that they don't have to give up their way of life. This is an old strategy. This is an old problem. Now, before I move on to verses 51 through 52, I'll add some history. After this point, after this entire story, after we're done with chapter 11 and the chronology of what has happened in history, we find that in AD 70, the community, the Jewish community was destroyed because it was in AD 70 that Jerusalem fell. And guess who did it? The Romans. AD 70. All right, so let's keep going in this story, but you've got the picture. In the back room, a discussion and an idea was presented, and that idea was, let's kill Jesus, because this is how we'll be able to save this community. It's interesting that John the writer, in verses 51 through 52, would note that Caiaphas, in having clearly ungodly intentions. He accidentally prophesied. You know, he, his unintentional prophecy was fitting because he was the high priest that year. So if anybody's going to give a prophecy, even unintentionally, you know, it, 
it, it came from Caiaphas. Caiaphas meant to suggest that Jesus be killed in order to save the Jews' land and familial solidarity. Um, but Caiaphas, he actually prophesied that Jesus would be killed in order to save both Jews and every other child of God worldwide. This occurrence would be God's will, brought about by evil intentions of human rulers. I want to read that. But verses 51 through 52 says, that, and this spake he, Caiaphas, not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should, not, should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. All right, so verses 53 through 57. I got a note here, a little blurb in my notes that said the block is hot. You know, Jesus was um, wanted in this area before. Uh, it was contested area before, but now it, it's, it, it's a space where he almost can't even be seen out in public. Why would I say that? Because uh, before the Pharisees, they'd given orders to arrest Jesus. We've seen that in, in between uh, John 6 through uh, 10. We've seen these instances where Pharisees had given orders to uh, the temple police, go arrest him right now. That, that, that the Pharisees had given orders to people, wherever you see him, let us know. That has happened already. We saw in John 10 how folks tried to stone Jesus. That, that has happened already. But here, this was different. Like this, this was different. The Pharisees, uh, they'd come together uh, with other aspects of the rulers of the community. You know, uh, this wasn't a uh, an isolated incident where they tried to snatch Jesus up. No, 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 no. Once all the rulers come together and the religious leadership of of this particular community have conjoined and agreed together to make a concerted effort to stop, arrest, and kill Jesus. At that point, Jesus became even more of a marked man. Think about Jesus being on an America's Most Wanted poster and being in an area called America. It's difficult to hide when your face is plastered on uh, on uh, on a wanted poster and people know what you look like and they, they, they have an idea where you're gonna be and all of them have an edict to give up your location. This was the environment that Jesus found himself at the end of John 11. And Jesus, he knew it. He, I mean, he could tell, you know, he, he, he's got, you know, disciples with him. He's got people um, extraneous to the disciples that are also following him. He's got supporters. He's got detractors. He's, he's, uh, he's aware of what's happening. And he knows that he has to stay off the radar. There was something like a federal warrant out for his arrest. And it's like, you know, he, he, he had to be very, very careful about where he showed himself because people were after him. This, this means that uh, uh, things were especially difficult for Jesus at this time. And he had to go north to a place uh, called Ephraim or the plot of land where Ephraim was uh, assigned said name inheritance. So he left Jerusalem to go up to Ephraim where he would be with his disciples for a time. But this was the season of the Passover. And you and I should know that having a bolo out on you, be on the lookout is hard enough. But whenever you have to come back to the religious and cultural center, the city of Jerusalem, because the Passover is coming, now it becomes extremely challenging. Well, people, because the Passover was, was nigh, again, this, this is uh, another one of the Passovers, the males from all around are all coming to Jerusalem. And because you see the same males every year, people know and have an idea of what Jesus' following looks like. And so people are looking around in Jerusalem trying to figure out if Jesus is going to show up or not. They're like, I mean, he has to show up. It's the Passover, right? He has to come. They're definitely looking for him, but, but he can't not show, right? That's the question that's being asked in verse 56. You know, people are looking for Jesus and they're talking among themselves. He's like, I mean, he has to come. So he's going to get arrested, right? There's no way he's not coming. And there was a 100% chance that folks are looking for him. He's going to get caught. That's what's going on in verse 56. And the last verse of chapter or of chapter 11, verse 57, says that um, it, there's a record of the warrant. 
that's out for Jesus' arrest. It says both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment. That means they told folks, put out a, an edict. They demanded of that community as community leaders that if anybody knew where Jesus Christ was, they called him Jesus or Yeshua. If anybody knew where Yeshua was, they're supposed to tell it so that he can be arrested. That's the end of verse chapter 11. All right, well, let's pray out. Um, I will see you in a couple of days so we can jump in on chapter 12. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your son. Thank you for coming down to earth, showing yourself to us, proving yourself to us, making you available to us by the way of the person of Jesus Christ, our salvation. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for being the one that would be the substitutionary means by which people like me and many of the viewers out here and even potential viewers in the future could have eternal life and a resonance with you in your home in heaven. We thank you so much for that now. Please make it so that everyone that is listening to this video clip would come across a laborer that you would send into that particular harvest. So they would come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the uh, pardon of their sins into the, the lordship of Jesus Christ so that they can come into the family of God. Help them make it so, God, that they meet someone that would share your message and offer them the opportunity to become sons and daughters of the living God. We thank you for this even now. Keep us the rest of the week in Jesus' name. Thank God and amen.